With that, why don't we go ahead and stand up and uh, let's get this uh, worship service started.
there we go. All right, so, well, glad you were all able to make it today, and we've got power, we've got AC, so yay. Oh my goodness. I know, right? The biggest praise for today. Well, hey, there's some really nice people around you. Why don't you greet them? Say hello to each other. And uh, greetings to the people joining us online. I uh, wanted to make sure that uh, we were also saying, if you can't make it in today, hey, the world's a little bit crazy. Hopefully we can catch you next week, okay? Uh, but you know, with everything going on, a couple things in your bulletin. Uh, feel free, you can have a seat, by the way. Um, on the back, if you'll notice, there's two things on there if you uh, need some assistance with your uh, place. Uh, crisis cleanup. If you call them before July 19th, they're able to uh, uh, filter the calls to those who are doing cleanup uh, in different places, so feel free to call them. The other spot, if you go to the restorationteam.org uh, slash assistance, they also have uh, teams that are uh, working, sending people around the area. And by the way, if you'd like to help volunteer with the group as well, uh, David Hampton has uh, been working with the restoration team, so feel free to reach out to him, and if you need to get his contact info, let us, let us know. Uh, by the way, Rock Dinner, I believe, is still scheduled for this Thursday, the 18th. Uh, is that? Yes. Okay, awesome. So we're just going to have that, the Ayara Thai Cuisine. Uh, by the way, in two weeks, Camp Lone Star is having their barbecue auction fundraiser. Uh, so if you're interested, check out the website to get some more information. Um, by the way, we were going to have the pastoral call committee uh, meeting after the second service today to give an update. Uh, leadership team asked if we could just wait for a week. I don't know why. Um, but we're going to go ahead and do that next week after the second service. So we'll have that update and everybody can uh, be able to ask questions. And then meeting after that will be the time to vote and move forward in that process. Okay? Um, so there are a lot of things. Be sure to check this out and uh, check out the happenings email that goes out as well. With that, we want to continue with our worship in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. There are a lot of times whenever we look at things happening in the world around us, and one of the easiest things to do is to figure out who else's job it's supposed to be. It's really easy that we can point at something and say, oh, I'm not, I'm not so great at that. You know what? I think someone else will take care of that. I think that's somebody else's concern more than mine. I don't really know them as well. I'm not really as connected as well. I should just walk away. But you see, the thing is, is that as much as we know that God is in control, part of that is that we've already said we're going to follow him. So if we've already said, God, I'm going to follow you, then why is it that we walk away when God's path points us to helping those people in front of us? God has it under control, and that's why he's called us to do this. So let's take a few moments our time that we come to God as we confess what's on our hearts, on our minds, and to be able to say, God, there have been times when I know that there was an opportunity to serve that was right in front of me. Or maybe not even what I was doing, but the way that I was speaking with someone, the hope I was supposed to share with this person, the light that maybe they hadn't seen, and maybe I walked away. So God, I thank you that you didn't walk away from me and I ask for your forgiveness for the times whenever I have ignored what you've placed in front of me to do. We bring our confessions to our merciful God.
God, we so often just walk past things. We, we feel like we've got too much to do or too much on our minds, or we spend so much time saying, God, I, you know, I want to go do something that makes me feel important or that I'm powerful in some way. But God, the small things, the smaller tasks, but even sometimes the smaller people, the people that in our minds somehow don't matter as much. God, they matter to you. God, we ask that you would still convict our hearts, that you would show us that how wrong that we are and how we are to come to you, not just for the forgiveness we need, but also that you would change our hearts and the way that we look at our world. Help us to see what we can do and help us to have the desire to do it. In Christ Jesus, amen. You are a part of God's perfect plan, as imperfect and flawed as you may be. This isn't God waiting for you to have it all figured out before he involves you. You are a part of it here and now. Because of what Jesus did, I have the joy of telling you that your sins are forgiven. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And yet, I know that even now, you're still going to struggle. So do you. And that's okay. But God is still calling you back again and saying, be a part of my plan. And I will still love you. And I ask that you bring that love to others as well. And in the meantime, in that love and grace, may we continue in our worship.
morning. The first reading is from Ephesians chapter 1, starting at the third verse, to be found on page 976 of your Pew Bible. Blessed be the Lord and Father, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us for adoption as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, with which he has blessed us in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will, according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time, to unite all things in him, things in heaven, and things on earth. In him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, so that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possessions of it, to the praise of his glory. This is the word of the Lord. God. Thank you, Ashley. Please rise for the gospel. Our gospel lesson comes from the sixth chapter of the gospel according to St. Mark, starting with the 14th verse. King Herod heard of it, for Jesus' name had become known. Some said, John the Baptist has been raised from the dead. That is why these miraculous powers are at work in him. But others said, he is Elijah. And others said, he is a prophet, like one of the prophets of old. But when Herod heard of it, he said, John, whom I beheaded, has been raised. For it was Herod who had sent and seized John and bound him in prison for the sake of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, because he had married her. For John had been saying to Herod, it is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. And Herodias had a grudge against him and wanted to put him to death. But she could not, for Herod feared John, knowing that he was a righteous and holy man, and he kept him safe. When he heard him, he was greatly perplexed, and yet he heard him gladly. But an opportunity came when Herod on his birthday gave a banquet for his nobles and military commanders and the leading men of Galilee. For when Herodias' daughter came in and danced, she pleased Herod and his guests. And the king said to the girl, Ask me for whatever you wish, and I will give it to you. And he vowed to her, Whatever you ask me, I will give you up to half of my kingdom. And she went out and said to her mother, For what should I ask? And she said, The head of John the Baptist. And she came in immediately with haste to the king and asked, saying, I want you to give me at once the head of John the Baptist on a platter. And the king was exceedingly sorry, but because of his oaths and his guests, he did not want to break his word to her. And immediately the king sent an executioner with orders to bring John's head. He went and beheaded him in the prison and brought his head out on a platter and gave it to the girl. And the girl gave it to her mother. When his disciples heard of it, they came and took his body and laid it in a tomb. This is the gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. We have the joy of knowing who God is, being Father, Son, and Spirit, and we proclaim who he is throughout our lives, but especially here in worship. We use these words as they have been given to us throughout the centuries by the various parts of the church, the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty, 
From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated as we join to sing Shepherd. God, as we know that you have continued to be the one to lead and guide us, we know that your designs, your plans, they are good, they are right. But God, we ask that you would make us mindful, that you would help us to be able to see the ways in which you are leading us to be a part of your plans. Lord God, help us not to sit by idly, but rather is to joyfully take up the cross and to walk with you along this journey. We thank you, God. In Christ Jesus. Amen. Howdy. So uh, I had somebody in the first service uh, say that he was surprised that I didn't preach on the gospel today. It was the first time that somebody was actually really sad about not having a beheading. I was a little surprised on that one. Um, but with it, though, is I was a little bit more distracted by the fact that I heard a rumor that there was a storm that blew through on Monday. I don't know. There might have been a little bit of rain and wind somewhere in there. Clearly, it could not have been that big of a storm because big storms only happen when I go out of town for at least a week at a time. So clearly, it could not have been that large. But the thing with it is that Hurricane Barrel came barreling through. If I had a penny for every time I heard that pun over this last week, oh my word. It's like I'm the one who's supposed to have the bad jokes. But it was amazing. It was like people kept describing these maps as the spaghetti map. And it was like because nobody had any real idea of where in the world it was going to go. And apparently we got to enjoy quite a bit of it. Thank you, Beryl. Much appreciated. Um, this, there were a lot of people that were going through quite a few things. But I did want to point out, though, if over this last week, if you didn't have somebody from the congregation that reached out to you,
to check on you and see how you are, please let us know, okay? Because that's one of the things we've been working on refining is just making sure that our heart is in the right place, just making sure that we've checked to make sure that everyone is okay. So please let us know if there was anybody that we missed in that regard, okay? Now, with it, though, is also pointing out, though, this last week we had a lot of issues that came up, all right? We had it, parts where there was no power throughout the area, times where the cell phones were dead in the water, you couldn't get texts, phone calls sounded like somebody was underwater, you thought they were actually in the storm themselves, the internet was spotty at best and sometimes absolutely useless. I'm currently having to use the notes from my phone because I couldn't print them today. It, all sorts of stuff going on in that regard. But you see, as much as we can look at our city and we can say that things should have been done better, okay, there's also something else that we do need to realize. We had a hurricane. I know, everyone's surprised. But some of the decisions that were made in advance of what happened they should have taken preparing for the storm more seriously, but we also need to consider we are a city near the Gulf of Mexico. We haven't funded infrastructure projects as effectively as we should have for decades now. And on top of that is that we need to always be prepared to handle the disasters that we come across and to help our neighbor in any circumstance. So while we should be able to trust those in authority, to be doing their job and looking out for us, there is still a level of uncertainty, a level of uncertainty in life that requires that we go the extra mile in these uncharted waters, hopefully figurative and not always literal. See, the idea of trusting in a greater plan but still facing uncharted waters I want you to have that in your mind, trusting in a greater plan, but facing uncharted waters, because this is what I want you to have in your mind as we are looking at Ephesians. Okay? We're going to be spending the next few weeks looking at Ephesians, and I want us to be able to realize that there's a lot that we take for granted here. The missionary, Paul, the apostle, we take it for granted oftentimes that Paul was this you know, great missionary and that he took care of reaching out to all the people outside of the Jewish community, all of those Gentiles, those non-Jewish people in the world. And yet, the issue is that Paul was facing new and difficult situations that were uncharted for him. Okay. See, Paul had been brought up in a community where they were expecting the Messiah to come at any day. They knew there was this one God, and they knew that this one God was going to be sending his Messiah to come. So to reach the Jewish community is, you've already had the way prepared for you. We're just showing you that Christ has come. But now imagine to be in a world where nobody has any concept of what you're trying to talk about. See, the thing is, is that while the Jewish people could know that God had chosen them and had called them to be his own, it was a very different message and a very different picture as Paul is going to the Gentile community. See, the thing is, is that trying to teach them, it's reaching out to people who, instead of thinking of there being this one true God, is that instead there's this pantheon of gods out there. And instead of believing that there is mercy and grace, is that instead it's a place where people don't really believe that anything that they do really matters much at all. And you can't really say it was right or wrong. You just go with whatever it is. I'm sure that we in 21st century America have no idea what it's like to live in a community that doesn't necessarily believe in one God or believe that there's a right and wrong. With it is that Paul understood that. But teaching the people of Ephesus about a Messiah that they hadn't known to expect, this is something that makes it difficult when you're coming in from a community that did. See, it would have been really convenient for Paul to look at all of those who are outside of the Jewish community and to say, you know what? God 
can do something himself, okay? God can send someone or something miraculous, okay? God can go take care of that in order to get their attention if he really wants to. If God really wants to get a hold of the Gentile people, he can take care of it. This isn't really my job, okay? It's not my job to worry about it because, well, I'm a Jew and I need to reach out to the Jewish community. That's going to be for somebody else to do. Over this last week, there were a couple times where we came to the church and we were like moving branches around. We ended up dragging a bunch of them to a giant pile. Uh, another person took the pile out to the road and there was a lot that we were taking care of. And at one point we saw that there was a bunch of trash next door out around the dumpster. Now the thing is, is that people in the neighborhood going through all these issues, they saw the dumpster was full, but they still left trash sitting around the dumpster. Now, in seeing this, the thing is, is that there were winds, there was rain still happening, there was all sorts of things. You don't want to leave that trash just sitting there. And we didn't know how long it was going to be before any of the services could come and take care of it. Now, let me just make it very clear. It was wet. It was nasty. You do not want to know what was growing inside of it. It was terrible. But we took the time and got as much of it as we could into our dumpster to try to help out and take care of it because we weren't sure who else would be able to do so. But what stood out to me was later on someone's response to what we did because the response was, you know, that was good of you to do that, but it isn't your job. Isn't it amazing how often we find ourselves in a world where everything is somehow designated and delegated as someone else's job? Someone is, else is always supposed to be the one doing it. Someone else mows our lawn. Someone else cleans our bathrooms. Someone else does surveys for us. Someone else writes our reports for us. Even if we go and use ChatGBT and OpenAI, okay, for the record, I wrote this sermon myself, all of the terrible jokes are completely blamed on me. But you see, we, we could not possibly be expected to do something that we feel is someone else's job. So we walk around it, ignore it, we tell ourselves that God or somebody else has it all figured out and we can just go back to our usual schedules and routines and not worry about it. But you see, as we read Ephesians 1.5, okay, this is oftentimes the way that we treat the concept of predestination. Predestination by God of the elect is this idea of that's not for me to deal with. I'm just not going to even bother. See, we talked about this somewhat uh, a few uh, months ago, but it bears revisiting when we see how Paul is talking to the Ephesians. Every time that we hear the term predestination, we know that God chose many people to be his own since before the world even began. Okay? Now, it's not based on whether we're good enough, but rather on God loving us. But you see, as soon as we hear this idea that God was choosing us before time began, what is the automatic question that we ask? Why did God choose to love some people and not others? Did he always want to condemn those other people? You see, the idea that God created some people specifically because he wanted to condemn them, it's not actually scriptural when you look at scripture as a whole. Yes, you could take a few verses here and there, pull them out of context, and say, oh, see, there you go, that's proof. God wanted these people to be condemned. But it's sort of like, imagine that you're getting on your parents' nerves, which I'm sure none of you have ever done at any point in your life. I know I'm the perfect son, clearly, but um, believe it or not, now, you go to them and you say, after you have made their lives miserable that day, and you say, but you still love me, right? 
And now imagine your parents are exhausted and all they can come up with is, you know, you probably just shouldn't ask me that today. It's been a bad day. Or, well, you know, you have a lot of good qualities. And you're kind of like, thanks, I really appreciate that. You know, one of those moments. One of those moments. But you see, of course, they love us if you look at your life as a whole with them. But it's the same thing about what Scripture is doing with God, is that every time Scripture points to God, knowing from the beginning of the creation that there would be those who are condemned, is that there's also something in that passage showing that God has brought so many of his enemies into his kingdom, is that God is deliberately giving everything he can to change it, everything he can, even his own son. Just a few examples. Isaiah 5, okay? God dug up the vineyard and cleared it of stones and planted it with the choicest vines. He built a watchtower in it and cut out a wine press as well, and then he looked for a crop of good grapes, but it yielded only bad fruit. He didn't build a vineyard to make bad fruit. He did everything possible for good grapes, and yet still they rejected his design. Romans 11 just as you were, who were at one time disobedient to God, have now received mercy as a result of their disobedience. So they too have now become disobedient in order that they may now receive mercy as a result of God's mercy to you. For God has bound everyone over to disobedience so that he may have mercy on them all. The disobedience part is that God is seeing it as saying, now I'm trying to get my mercy to you. I'm communicating my mercy to you. In Proverbs 16, the Lord has made everything for its purpose, even the wicked for the day of trouble. Ooh, that's a weird passage. Everyone who is arrogant in heart is an abomination to the Lord. Be assured he will not go unpunished by steadfast love and faithfulness, iniquity is atoned for. And by the fear of the Lord, one turns away from evil. When a man's ways please the Lord, he makes even his enemies to be at peace with him. This whole part about the wicked for the day of destruction, but when you look at all of it, okay, this is not some parent trying to say like that they have a child that became a criminal as if they wanted them to become that imagine that parent has a child who is now a criminal they could easily say i gave birth to a criminal or they could say i raised a criminal that's not because they meant for their child to be that in the first place but rather is that they acknowledge where their child ultimately went, and they're taking responsibility as the parent. That's the thing about God, is that he's not desiring this, but he's acknowledging, I am God overall, and I still acknowledge that there are those who reject me, even though I've loved them. See, if we start looking at the world, as those whom God wants in his kingdom, you know, us great people, and those who are not really worth his time, don't bother. Then we forget that we all started out in life as God's enemies. All of us. We started in the same place. We look at Ephesus, and it's this place with temples to various gods and a way of looking at the world differently. But instead of assuming that it was someone else's job to reach them because, well, God is ultimately in charge, right? So God can figure it out himself. God's got something he can do, right? Instead, Paul made every effort to connect with them. And even he had passed through and shared the gospel, hey, that's great, goes out of his way to come back again and spend three years with them to start a church and to make sure that they knew God because we all start in this place of not knowing God. We don't know his grace. We don't even want God when we first get started. Crying raisin of a baby that we are. Somewhere along the way, we have been brought to know Christ Jesus. 
and what he did. Washed in baptism, following him each and every day. That is what Paul knew about the Gentiles, is that God wanted them, even the ones who knew nothing about him and had no interest in them, in him, God still wanted them to know him as well. And that was the whole point about why Paul was focusing on predestined. Because up to that point, the Jewish community saw themselves as chosen by God. So what is Paul letting the Gentiles know? So are you. You were also a part of the plan from the beginning. This isn't, oh no, uh, the Jewish religious leaders crucified Jesus. Well, I guess maybe we'll let the Gentiles in. God always wanted the rest of the world to know him. That was always the plan. That was always what he intended. In verses 13 and 14, In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it, to the praise of his glory. Because all of those who believe in Christ are then called predestined, elect, and sealed. End of story. All of them. And Paul is making sure that the Ephesians know, you didn't start off with this story, but God still had a plan for you to know him too. Wherever you are from, whatever that background was, the plan was always for you. But the question is, do we have the same intentions? Do we seek to save the lost? Or do we just, eh, we'll just see what happens. How many times, how many ways is it that we would go out of our way to save the lost, and yet how many times do we just assume God will figure it out somehow? See, that's the thing that we ended up seeing with this storm this last week. It was so easy to be able to say, you know what? It'll get figured out. There are people coming. They're going to take care of it. It's figured out, okay, well, should we check on the neighbors that we have? They're, they're probably fine. I'm sure they would have told us if something was an issue. Well, you know what? It's not really that hot outside. You know, it's not really that big an issue. Everybody knows the Wi-Fi is out. We'll just take a break from the, you know, social media for a bit. It'll be okay. I'm sure it'll all get taken care of. But that's one of the things that we realize is that it doesn't always all get taken care of. But even more than that, why do we assume that we're not supposed to be a part of that plan ourselves? We're also meant to be. This isn't something just to put off onto an energy company or onto a city or onto some other group. This is also for us. This is our world. This is our community. This is our opportunity to be a part of what the plan is, to love and to share grace and mercy with those around us. The question is, do we want to do that with the gospel just because the people around us, they're a little bit different. Maybe they're not expecting it. Maybe we have to do things a little differently than the way we expected it. But you see, it's more than just waiting at what may happen. It's not just, maybe God will let somebody stumble across my path and then the right moment, the right instant where, hey, I think they want to know about Jesus and then I'll say it. Are we also preparing for it too? Are we also looking for the ways in which we in our world can share the gospel? Are we planning that we're going to be out there doing it? Do we realize that our planning to get out there is part of the plan God had in mind from the beginning? You, you are a major part of that plan, and you're meant to be. So that's the thing about this is that God has a plan for reaching the lost. It's us. Rather than assuming or hoping that somebody else will take care of it, that's for us. But even more than that, 
As Paul closed this particular section in talking about Christ being above all, as Christ sees us and knows what we are doing, do we want Christ looking at us and we can say, hey God, yeah, uh, don't worry, someone's got it taken care of. Uh, I'm, I'm sure you've got it all in plan. I'm just, gonna, I'm just gonna sit here and do my thing, but hey, good job. Or is he looking down saying, you, my child, are the one to take the message to the world. So wherever we see we can do so, and however we see we can do so, may we realize that we're the plan. And may we be willing to go into the uncharted world no matter what disaster may come, because we know that God is in control and his plan involves us. Thanks be to God. Please rise for prayer. Lord God, we are seeing that things around us have been really difficult. God, we see the the electrical poles, we see the ones that have snapped in half, we see the tree branches everywhere, we know so many places that don't even have power, even today. God, we, we don't know all the ins and outs of what happened, but God, we do ask that you would empower and move all of those who are working in this community to help those in this, in this area to get back on their feet. But Lord God, also we ask that you would put it on our hearts, put it on our minds, that we would go forth and we would reach out to see what can we do? How can we help? Whether that to be a warm meal or a place to rest or even just a chance to charge somebody's phone. But God, we also ask that we would do the same with your message, that we would not assume that someone else has it figured out, that instead we would realize that we are a part of that plan that you predestined from the beginning of the world. And Lord God, we ask that you would move us, that we would see and we would desire to be a part of that. Lord, in your mercy, Lord God, we live in a tumultuous world where people do hideous things. God, we are grateful that our former president did not get killed. We are grateful that that bullet did not hit the right spot. But Lord, we also mourn for the loss of the life that was taken that day. Lord God, we ask that you would not only bless their family and all of those who mourn, but also God, we ask that you would touch hearts and minds Lord God, show people that this is not how we deal with issues. Lord God, whenever we see the world that is differently, it is not for us to call one another to violence or to anger. Lord God, may we not be a people that try to lash out to stop people in some ultimate way just because we don't like them. And God, may, may we not respond to these issues that come up in these times of violence with anger because God, we don't want to compile this anymore. God, help us to be able to see one another as gifts of life and hope from you and help us to be able to live in this country, this country that people have fought and bled for, not in a state of anger and animosity, but rather as people who want to love and live freely with each other with the hope that we would not only know you, but live a life that is pleasing to you. Lord, in your mercy. Lord God, we ask that you would bless all of those who are struggling in different ways. Lord God, we ask that you would bless Donna as she is going through different tests and that she is recovering from. And Lord God, we ask that you would bless the results and whatever may come from it. We ask that you would remind her that you are with her, that you love her, and that you are strengthening her, and that we are there with her to do whatever we can. Lord God, we know that there are so many things that are in your plan that are outside of our control. So, Lord God, we just ask that you would show us what we can do and move us to do so. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We thank you that you hear us, you lead us, you guide us, even as you have taught us how to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. You may be seated. Uh, as we're bringing our offerings to God, um, please make note on the cards that are in front of you. Uh, they're all the same card. 
with it is just be sure to put on there not just the prayer requests that are on your heart, but also anything you wanted to make sure that we're aware of. And, and if we did miss reaching out to you, please make a note of that. Uh, we're working on that with our spiritual welfare and care to make sure that everybody is correct, connected, everybody is cared for, and also we just want you to be able to know that you do matter. And whatever it is that's on your heart right now that you believe to bring to God at this time, we invite you to do so. Especially also those joining us online, we know that while you can't be here physically, if you feel called to do so, you can use our website to be able to go in and bring your offerings uh, as well. Let nothing keep us from doing so as God calls us. We bring our offerings to the Lord. Please rise. We had a lot of issues over this last week with uh, whether you could open your fridge, whether or not you knew that you were getting a hot meal or just something that was a sandwich. We didn't know what all was going on. We were unsure of a lot of things, but what we're not unsure of is that Christ is with us and that his meal of forgiveness is ours now and always. See, the night when our Lord Jesus was betrayed, he, he took bread and he gave thanks and he broke it and he gave it to his disciples and he said, take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And the same way also, after supper, he took the cup. When he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, take and drink of it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Christ Jesus has given himself for us, and as we receive this meal, he is affirming for you, salvation, forgiveness are yours. For all those who believe that Christ has given his life for you, not just for everybody in general, but specifically for you, and that in this meal, this is affirmed for you, you are invited to come forward and to receive it. If you need the gluten free, just point it out to me, and we'll get that to you. For those who need alcohol free, it's the clear liquid in the center. Let nothing keep you from the table of our Lord. May the peace of the Lord be with you always. You may be seated.
please rise. We know that we are called by God to be his people. And that's why he's sending us out there so that there are more people to be called and elect by God. So may we do so with an open heart and the desire that not only are we a part of that plan, but also that others get to be a part of that as well. Let's close our worship as we join to sing. May the Lord God bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his favor upon you and give you his peace. Amen. All right. Have the, hope you get your AC back on. All right.